rattlesnake. Here you get permanently shattered soil. How about rolling that one over? No way. Then, okay. one of the most spectacular okay, discoveries of the mission. Look at the size of that biggie. <laughs> it is a biggie, isn't it? It may be further away than we think. Because no, it's not very far. It was just right beyond you. And we better press on for the big boulder. Okay, we're headed that way. You get the tongs, uh, John? Yep. We're out here in the right. If, if we could see to the bottom, we could say for sure if this big black rock is right out of the bottom. But uh, my guess from the old photographs is it probably is. Okay, that sounds like a good guess. God, you really weren't at it? No. It looks like they were standing right there. Look at the size of that rock. <laughs> Curious what they're going to look like when they stand next to it. <laughs> well, you can see. Once I get to it, the bigger it is. Yeah, but look at the pretty shattered part, Charlie. On this side over here? Yeah. And as our crew slowly sinks, <laughs> we bet the founder disappeared into the sunset. Well, Tony, that's your half rock right there. Very good. Don't get too near the edge of that thing; it falls off. Look, look over, look over at your right; it falls off pretty good. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we Keep going. <laughs> Can't believe it. I can't either. Okay, let's go on back. I am. Be right with you. And we encourage you just to look for some variety. But now it was time to head back to their base and close out the EVA. All right, we think you could just about to head south now. Yeah. The only reason. During the previous EVA, a section of a rear fender had come off the rover, causing the astronauts to receive occasional showers of lunar dirt. That's a beautiful sight. Young parked the rover, then moved out to join Duke. Enter the lunar module and prepare for liftoff. Boy, Houston, the beauty of this place is just absolutely incredible. Smile. Yeah. F.A.O. Don't be mad. We'll get it up there. See how nice and leisurely it's been? That's the way it should be, getting ready for ascent. Ten seconds. What a ride. What a ride. It's over on time. Together in orbit, the two spacecraft pirouetted, each inspecting the other. This is one of the fastest maneuvers I've made in a long time. The inspections complete, the command module and lunar module maneuvered to docking. John Young, Ken Mattingly, and Charlie Duke reunited aboard the command module, settle down for tomorrow's tasks, jettison the lunar module, and burn out of orbit to come home. April 25. Ken Mattingly left the confines of the command module cabin, 173,000 miles from Earth. As he orbited the moon, he had not only made visual observations, he had been operating a complex series of experiments. Many of these had returned instant data to Houston. Two had taken thousands of high-resolution pictures of the lunar terrain. Now, Mattingly retrieved the film canisters and made his way back to the cabin with them, as Charlie Duke stood in the hatch to help him. It had been quite a mission. In John Young's words, I think we've seen as much in a in 10 days, as most people see in 10 lifetimes. April 27, the last day.
The crew looked out their windows through the 5,000 degree fireball of re-entry at their native planet. dreamed of this. You probably replayed this moment a thousand times. You probably imagined the awe-inspiring, indescribable rush of the ride. You probably celebrated the miraculous, cheered the momentous, and mourned the shocking. You probably still dream of what could be. We did. We do. And while many thought we were through, no. We've been learning. We've been building. We've been training. And now, it's time. Because the next frontier is not just for the next generation. It's for this generation. It's for me, and it's for you. For everything we still dream about. We go. The laser, a useful tool in industry, science, and medicine. When it comes down to it, a laser is just a light with extreme focus. It's both elegantly simple and extremely complicated. And it changed the way we literally see the dimensions of our Earth, our Moon, the planets, asteroids, and beyond. But it was a long road to get there. Back in the 1980s at NASA, using lasers to measure physical features from space was too experimental, too risky. Fortunately, it was also a time of change and risk-taking at Goddard Space Flight Center. In the 1960s, there was probably not much question. When a science or applications mission came up, for the most part, it went to Goddard. And we, we've got to do a better job 
of selling ourselves and being sure that we're responsive to what headquarters is looking for in terms of the, the competition between ourselves and other NASA centers. I came here as uh, hired by the center director, Noel Hinners, in 85, and he said, so what do you want to do? I said, I want to map the topography of Mars, you know, at this scale, not the scale of buildings. Um, how do we do that? And he goes, well, we've got folks, they do stuff. And so I met a few of them very quickly, and that was Jim Abshire, John Gagnon, Jack Bufton. We started working with laser remote sensing instrumentation. It was the same type of instrumentation that communicated from ground to satellites in satellite laser ranging. We could do a little airborne laser remote sensing, and Garvin and I sort of found each other through that. You know, I said, come on down to Wallops and we'll fly this. And he said, oh, topography, Earth, yes, I want to measure it. We literally took a T-39 training aircraft that was put together by the Wallops team, really impressively, and um, bolted in a big telescope with a, a laser and went flying out in northern Arizona, where I had done some field work. So out there, we have Meteor Crater, we have volcanoes, and we have the Grand Canyon, and other, the Painted Desert. So we figured in one place we could study all this. And it was on the strength of that that, that Jim Garvin became interested and it put him in a position to when Dave Smith found that his radar altimeter was canceled because it was $30 million instead of 10. They kept talking to me about, you know, look, we're really close to getting a laser altimeter working. And I've been in lasers actually for 20 odd years before that, if you know what I mean, on but laser ranging from the ground to space work. So I was very familiar with the lasers. And I wasn't averse to it, on the contrary. But NASA offered me a, the situation that said, look, we've got a certain amount of money for you. We're willing to spend $10 million on this instrument. Uh, but, uh, you know, there has to be some sort of competition. You need to choose which instrument uh, you would like to fly to measure the altimetry. And there were four candidates. Um, three of them are radar and one the laser that we call MOLA. There was no one in their right mind that would bid a laser altimeter. Seriously. And I was all gung-ho. I was a young guy, you know, no gray hair. There was a lot of reticence. There was so little uh, trust that this could be done. NASA has made a monumental achievement in, in both radi radar and, and visible near-infrared imaging of the surfaces of Earth and other planets. But those are flat field views in the missing dimension, the hidden dimension, which drives uh, where energy goes, where the water flows, you know, stability of landscapes is the third dimension. We take for granted the laser is better. In time, Goddard would become a leader in LIDAR, in mapping our Earth and planets with unprecedented precision. But for now, they had to actually build the first one. The requirements were, of course, we were in a much higher orbit. The orbit was faster than going around the moon, so we needed a larger telescope. We needed a more sensitive detector. We needed more laser energy. So, uh, in order to put our concept together, we had to gather a team and then we had to convince their management that this was not a crazy idea and that we actually had a realistic chance of making this happen. We worked a lot of hours. I, I can remember uh, uh, Jim talking about, you know, working 10-hour days and I was doing about the same, but you know, it, it really, it really didn't matter because it was so, so exciting. Um, to, to be working on something that was going to actually uh, map Mars. I was fresh out of getting my master's degree in computer engineering. I was young, I mean, I was, um, it was, I had to really dive in deep. I had to spend about two years uh, working with the team uh, on algorithms. How are we gonna uh, find the surface of, the, of Mars? How are we gonna track it? How are we gonna uh, compute all the precise ranges? And we were just, we were sort of making our way. We were, we were defining the rules as we went. We finished the instrument pretty much on time. <laughs> and certainly, as they, as they said in the letter to me, look, if you don't make it on time and in budget, we will fly a brick instead, okay? We're not going to hold this mission up. I mean, I knew about planetary missions. They have to go within certain windows. But anyway, we made it all right. Five, four... Three, two, one. 
and liftoff, liftoff of the Titan III rocket with the Mars Observer and America's return to the Red Planet. And the vehicle has cleared the tower. We've got X-band launch at Canberra. Yeah, all right. assume that the spacecraft properly executed its orbit insertion sequence and we presume the spacecraft is in orbit about Mars but we have no positive confirmation of that because as for the last three days we have no communication with the spacecraft. Just to say you simply don't know what happened it could be in orbit it could have flown past the planet. What are the scientists doing to relieve the tension in there? Screaming loudly probably. <laughs> we still don't have communication with the spacecraft. However we are very hopeful and we're cautiously optimistic that communication Every day, will be restored. Fact, without communications clearly lessens our probability of success. You say, though, you know, we give up. We have not given up. On 21 August 1993, a tragic event occurred. Communications with the Mars Observer spacecraft were lost during a sequence referred to as the pressurization sequence. This was a sequence in preparation uh, for insertion to orbit about Mars. Once again, I mean, we're always trying things because they're hard, not, not because they're easy. Uh, and so once in a while, uh, we're going to have a failure because we are trying hard things. But I had been fully anticipated that we could have problems with this instrument. This was a new ball game completely, okay. But I was not concerned about the spacecraft. It never crossed my mind that spacecraft would let us down. And so this was a blow in the sense of, uh, wow, something I completely didn't expect. You know, we held out hope for a while maybe it would come back, um, maybe they'd find it or recover it or something, and then eventually that settles down and you realize the mission was lost. I, I, I was devastated. I think we, we all were, and it, was, it really wasn't clear at the time uh, whether we were going to have a, 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 a follow-on to, to actually do what the mission was supposed to do. So that was extremely hard to take. What made it easier is the amount of time we had for grieving was actually pretty short. NASA decided that we want to continue this and go back to Mars. And so we had to snap out of it, literally, and, and get back to thinking about uh, and fighting for uh, the next mission, which is Mars Global Survey. It was a difficult time, and it was the first time I think I really felt I had to get in there and argue with my colleagues, but as the PI, was particularly for me, um, that we needed to get to back to Mars and we needed to get back with this instrument. Knowing that they couldn't carry all six or seven instruments, only four would go, the laser ultimate had to be one of them, okay? The engineers had a chance to kind of just not change it, but, you know, just do some things a little bit better. That's what engineers like to do is... Um they fix all their first round mistakes in the second round and make new ones. <laughs> we were asked immediately, how long will it take you to rebuild another copy of MOLA? Uh, how much is it going to cost? Can you get your team back together in time? Do you have the parts? Or so there was immediately a flood of things we had to do. Jim Asher brought me in for the detector engineer who, who just led the Goddard at the time. So I was lucky to join the team working on the detectors. We were only given, I think it's three years to rebuild it. It's just shorter than usual. And everyone, all the management knew is that means there's no wiggle room really in your schedule. But the team was uh, largely still there and everyone is geared up to redo it since the first one didn't make it. So everyone really wanted to do it again and do it right. While the Goddard team was building MOLA-2 for the Mars Global Surveyor mission, a small team seized a long-awaited opportunity to hitch a ride on the space shuttle. 
with an experiment known as the shuttle laser altimeter. I think confidence comes from demonstration. Sometimes you have to do more, sometimes you have to do less. Working personally to build that instrument, we built it at Goddard in our lab down the hall without any fancy paperwork or flight procedures or anything. We just built it. I was hired then uh, to come on board working on the shuttle laser altimeter and I was brought in specifically to work on precise positioning, precise pointing, and precise geolocation of the surface footprints. And uh, we tested it on the roof, signed it over to a bank building 11 kilometers away, lined it up, and it was ready for the shuttle. It was a hitchhiker special that we flew with help from NASA headquarters on the space shuttle Endeavour. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour in pursuit of a Japanese satellite. They turned it on for us in the first the first time they turned it on. The shuttle's upside down with the laser pointing at Earth. We're over the middle Pacific. First light showed all this fuzz over the surface of the Earth. We're all looking. We thought we got something wrong. We realized later we were seeing the boundary layer clouds over the ocean. When we came to land, the fuzz was the height of the trees. All of a sudden, the laser pulses got shorter and shorter distances. The first landfall of the shuttle laser altimeter in the first orbit went right over the summit of the Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii. Well, we're extraordinarily delighted to report that the shuttle laser altimeter experiment, it's a hitchhiker experiment on STS-72, has performed absolutely nominally. In fact, everything has worked even beyond our expectation. And, and that was a, a genuine first light experience with MOLA technology, but on Earth. You really had to get those data sets out there, and you had to get a couple people that uh, really bought into it and built on it and convince others that, that this worked. As the data from the shuttle laser altimeter began to convince some skeptics, the Goddard team finished the MOLA instrument again. Our MOLA team really came through. It was just really uh, another great experience for many of us, including me. We were able to deliver to the Mars Global Surveyor project, and it got launched. And we have liftoff of NASA's Mars Global Surveyor as America begins its journey back to the Red Planet. Six solids. And when Mars Global Surveyor started getting closer to Mars, we were going to go into this error breaking phase. That was an opportunity that we had to go ahead and turn on the lasers and see if we could track the surface. Somebody be carrying. 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 Somebody that must be the native of that. I'm hungry. You didn't really like that sound. Look at the laser coming back. Great sense of body. Space crash. Space crash. Space crash. Space crash. Space Over a decade later, the Goddard team had proof planet scale laser altimetry worked. It could map distant craters and valleys and mountains. It changed the game. Today, we've ushered in a new era in the remote sensing of Mars. And this particular data set that we've acquired has in fact enabled us to generate what we consider a very detailed description of the shape of the planet Mars. This has you know, significant implications for the flow of water early on Mars. We believe this is one of the youngest features on the planet. We're seeing a planet that is very different from Earth. And it's telling us something about the Earth in an indirect way that says that not everything works in the way that we originally had in mind kind of measurements that we're making now are allowing us to, you know, characterize Mars on time scales of days to years now. And, and then the next step is to try to go back eons and try to figure out what changed on Mars. I mean, at that time, we used to brag that Mars was mapped better than the Earth. You know, the accuracy of Mole was so good and uh, 
And after a couple of years, the coverage was so good. It was, a, it was definitely a more accurate map of a planet than any planet. And this came out of, it can't be done in the mid 80s, to a tool that we now accept as the standard. For uh, those of us that worked on MOLA, it was transformative. It wasn't at a destination or a place that we were as much as a place that we would become. Following MOLA, in some ways we were in demand to consider whether we could provide a laser altimeter to uh, uh, another mission. A few missions, actually. It was no longer a question of if LiDAR could work, but where else it could work. But as the opportunities to test the limits of LiDAR arose, so did the challenges ahead. The Goddard team quickly began to see the evolution of LiDAR missions, building on the successes of new frontiers mapped by MOLA. We've measured the uh, changes, the seasonal changes in the Mars ice caps, both the North Pole and the South Pole. We've measured the volumes, we've measured the mass that's involved in that. We now have a density. So now we know the kind of processes that are taking Dave Smith invited me to be on the MOLA altimetry science team. And that was because of my experience with using altimetry over land rather than ocean processes. Zwali was an obvious choice to study the Martian ice caps for MOLA. Given his decades of expertise with our own polar regions, studying the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica through the 1970s and 80s. And then as we went into the 80s, NASA was was sort of the beginning of the development of the Earth Observations Program. So the Earth Observing System, I think, will be the, the first effort targeted at looking at the whole Earth system as a system, rather than just the little components that make it up. Somewhere along then, I teamed up with Jim Abshar. Jay had been pushing for a long time for a dedicated ice altimetry mission, which turned into ISAT-1. Designing ISAT-1 marked a major leap in what LiDAR needed to do and how challenging it would be to do it. To measure the changing ice sheets, the LiDAR had to be far more precise, cover the same tracks season to season, and it needed more power and a larger instrument which meant much more time to build. We built a simulator for ISAT-1 that allowed us to sort of figure out how precise it could be, how we would process the waveform data coming back, how we would track the surface. This algorithm was much more complicated than anything I had ever worked on before. But all this meant essentially for, for the ISAT mission, we needed a much uh, more advanced version of MOLA. In Mars, we really didn't know what was there until we got the measurements, so we were doing discovery. On Earth, we have to make quantitative measurements about what's happening. Four, three, two, one. And we have ignition and liftoff of NASA's ISAT and Chipset spacecraft looking at stars and ice. But after, you know, we'd worked on glass at that point more than a decade, and it already launched, and usually you think, okay, now we're going to be able to enjoy the data coming down, and what can we see in the data? But there was much more, what is this mystery we're seeing? Why is the laser energy going down? Things were not working the way we expected them to, and there were mysteries, and we weren't expecting, after MOLA in particular, to have mysteries at that point. One of these unexpected mysteries came down to the wire. Several wires, actually. What happened on glass was the laser diodes had, uh, had uh, gold bond wires and, and indium solder. If you bring these two metals together, even though they're not reactive, they do combine to form gold indite. The gold indite ate away at the wires, leading to added thermal stress, and eventually the failure of the first laser. And the second and third lasers were degrading as well. Tough decisions were ahead. When these missions operate, there's a lot riding on the missions. You don't want to make any mistakes. You uh, want to optimize things as best you can. The question was, given that we would have so much lifetime expectancy from the lasers, well, the scientific decision was that the best way to use that was to operate for periods of about a month and do that three times a year. That decision paid off when ISAT showed dramatic change in land ice around Greenland, 
and it also proved that LiDAR could be used to measure something called sea ice freeboard, a major breakthrough in determining sea ice thickness and an essential science goal for the future of ice measuring satellites. Even though the ISAT project required much more uh, care and feeding, it really laid the groundwork for all the subsequent missions that Goddard has, has flown. Around the same time that ISAT was developed, Goddard was tasked with designing a laser for measuring a place far from any icy poles. Sean Solomon was the PI of Messenger, and he said, you know, I've been asked to PI a mission to Mercury. I really want a laser altimeter on board. Can you make one that will work there? So the short answer seemed to be, yeah, I don't see why not, but there will be extreme thermal circumstances that we'd have to worry about. That was a really tough one because you fly in close to the 800-degree planet and, and then you, you, you have a 12-hour orbit. The temperature changes uh, by tens of degrees in, in a few minutes. It, it had to always uh, shield itself from the sun constantly, which meant that in orbit it was often at a very high angle. It was a challenge to try to continually figure out where the surface of Mercury was. And then they wanted to be small, uh, much smaller than a mole. I think it's up to a quarter or a fifth of the size. But I remember the manager who was running it for us <coughs> at the time kind of said, you realize I've, I've thinned every wire in this uh, electronic package so thin that you better not look at it twice because it might break but that's the level we had to go to get within the 10 kilograms okay and um, MLA was the laser altimeter that we proposed and this was really pushed the uh, the limits of what we could reasonably expect to do despite the extreme environmental gauntlet the mercury laser altimeter kept on collecting data for four years right up until the very end when Messenger crashed into Mercury in 2015. But before that, it captured historic views of the planet's topography. It is time for America to take the next steps. Beginning no later than 2008, we will send a series of robotic missions to the lunar surface to research and prepare for future human exploration. And then one day, a president, I think it was George Bush, suddenly decided we're going to go back to the moon. Well, all of a sudden, okay. When we're thinking about putting a LIDAR around the moon for a long time, actually. And I really wanted to have a crack at doing a good one uh, for, uh, instrument for, for the moon. I mean, I, my interest was in gravity and topography, two things that need to come together to measure the structure of a planet. And then all of a sudden, we got a call from headquarters, can you design a LIDAR around the moon, to map the moon, to map the topography. And so the instruments were chosen from proposals based on the ability to help select sites and determine the, the, uh, the safety of landing in particular sites on the moon. The LIDAR would be the Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter, or LOLA, and it marked another leap into laser altimetry. We also came up with the idea uh, of having multiple beams. We managed to put five beams on the surface, and that kind of changed the, the, the observational strategy, if you know what I mean, of five parallel beams. But after launch, Lola was suspiciously silent. When Lola started, I think that was just devastating. We didn't get any measurement at nighttime uh, when we first turned on. It was, so it was quite a shock, and it was the first <laughs> lidar that didn't work uh, at the initial turn on. The, the people that are heavily involved in the instrument development, you're pulled back in if there's surprises that occur. On Lola, the blankets were all tied tightly to the beam expander and the telescope, and this germanium black capton, which we didn't test with, was, was very uh, strong. And then we uh, caused a misalignment. I, rem I remember we discussed whether we wanted to check the alignment at spacecraft level, and I, you know, I th we just decided not to do it. I, I think that was my fault, because we could have. We started in the worst possible orbit for that failure mechanism, and so we, we were out of alignment, and we had no signal at all, and that was just a, that was a, that was a tough couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, it is a 
It is a lessons learned for life uh, for me. A couple weeks later, we noticed a little blip at the South Pole, and so we had some hope. And it eventually just, you know, as the orbit progressed, it, uh, the signal kept getting, getting stronger and stronger on, on the daylight side. Despite a bumpy start, in time, Lola and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission became revolutionary in mapping our moon. Uh, and it, it's turned out to be exceptional in terms of describing the topography of, of the moon. As a result of, of Lola, I think largely, if not the others as well, the doubts about whether a laser altimeter, for example, could last age limits, lifetime limits on the laser altimeter uh, <clears throat> were dispelled. Cold Atom Laboratory is in many ways the coolest thing and the coldest thing we've ever done on the International Space Station. It is allowing us to investigate cold quantum gases and make breakthroughs in areas of physics that up until now have been unavailable to us. NASA built the International Space Station to do the kind of research that we're doing in the Cold Atom Lab. This is the first time we're able to study this fifth state of matter in space. Bose-Einstein condensation is an amazing feat of engineering in itself, but this type of physics is difficult to do in ground-based experiments, and so doing this in microgravity is going to allow us to really see what's going on. So you have something cool, how do you make it cooler? You put it in space. Our ability to study cold atoms is really going to advance our knowledge in areas that will help us in quantum computing, quantum communications, and learn even more about gravity and how it interacts in our universe. I thought it was honestly so like a crazy idea given the amount of time that we have. The probability of failure was unacceptable. Engineers don't like designing when there are too many unknowns. They fooled me into taking this job saying that, oh, it won't be that hard. It's a reflay to Mars Pathfinder. You have all the pieces there. We knew it would be a challenge, but I don't think we adequately assessed how difficult it would be. I think in the back of your mind, you're always prepared for anything to happen, but this wasn't one of the places that we thought something would go wrong. Come on, man. You don't put a system like this on, a major spacecraft like this, at the last moment. Mm. Okay, we're going to have to get out. The trouble is, it's great on paper, but until you put it out there and test it, you really don't know what you have. You know, I tell my people that in terms of my top ten list of worries, the first three are schedule, schedule, and schedule, and there's nothing in fourth place. I came to the realization that the heritage wasn't in the blueprints. The heritage was in the people. Our next pass through this, if it doesn't come together, it's an all-go-home thing. It's over. Six green board. Five, four, three, two, one.
the end of 1999, the Mars Polar Lander and Mars Climate Orbiter missions failed. Now, if you GPL was responsible for these missions, and that changed everything. There was a loss of confidence. What had to be done was we had to get back in the saddle. We had to get something landed on the surface of Mars. The problem was we didn't have a lot of time. We have to go back to something we know. Pathfinder lander. And because of that confidence, we can do it in a short time. We got to take the Pathfinder lander and stick a rover in it. to go to launch, and that's just very, very tight for a mission of this kind of complexity. And we've been fighting that challenge since the beginning. You worry about, am I got the right plan? Do I really have it figured out? Are we on track? Can we stay on track? I'll briefly go over launch crews and EDL and just give you a, an idea of how the downlink process works during those phases. I'll spend a lot more time on surface specifically the tactical downlink process. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about a couple key additional requirements for Red Rover Goes to Mars. You start getting into this, this cycle of, of things changing just a little bit here and just a little bit there, and all of a sudden the mass got heavier, and so other things had to change. Your design heritage, the blueprint, I use the phrase, a phrase that I will never use again because no one will believe me, is build to print. I said, we will take the Mars Pathfinder lander and build to print. We will take the blueprints and we will send it to the machine shop, build these same things again, and that will be the shell that we land in. And then we just have to design this rover that fits inside. That build to print concept is the one thing that was completely wrong. Message here is if you see something that you don't like from the MAR mission system design, I'm one of the people you complain. I came to the realization that the heritage wasn't in the blueprints. The heritage was in the people. And the people who have designed this thing before, they've gone through these, this design work, they've experienced all the difficulties, they know how to solve it. And then we have a final TCM at 48 hours out. airbag systems to cushion a rover that's going to Mars. Well, we have a deadline to meet for testing, so we have to work a lot of hours and work hard and get it done on time and make it work good, too. A lot of it is sewing through th these thick layers. It's very difficult. The stuff we coat it with makes it hard to go through. We've had to get special needles, special machines, and it takes a lot of strength to press it out with your fingers and sew it. I've done both. I've worked suit parts, I've worked gloves, and, that, and I've worked these. It's like peas and carrots, you know? Gloves are more delicate, more complicated mentally, smaller. This is physically challenging because it is heavy. We have a lot of questions, because in the whole time you're building it, 
you're wondering, is this going to be right? Is it going to be okay? Is it going to work? You can't imagine the, the joy. We were jumping up and down when Pathfinder landed and was successful. And, and that's what we want to bring into this. Well, how would you feel if you knew that something you had actually worked on and touched every day was on Mars? Our names are on Mars because we got to sign the lander panel of Pathfinder. And believe me, we'll have our initials in some of these scenes too. So we were right up to the hairy edge. We were supposed to just be checking the box. We were waiting to see if we had a working airbag system. It was pretty scary. <laughs> it's amazing. You never would have guessed that this rock would cause so much trouble. No, it's not. This is sharp. They fooled me into taking this job, saying that, oh, it won't be that hard. It's a reflight of Mars Pathfinder. You have all the pieces there. Put it together again, it'll work. And every single last darn piece on that entry descent landing system had to be redesigned, sometimes almost from scratch. So we're using the reference drop for this first drop. MER as being this heritage, this build to print. You never get to do that. rather than driving the system. I wanted to see firsthand and understand the challenges. And sometimes you can't really understand it unless you are there on site and seeing all the debates that bring out those subtle nuances of the design that you do not hear any other way. We thought we understood how the airbag system was going to behave. We knew it was marginal and nobody was expecting it to be a robust. But the initial design failed and got damaged in ways we were not expecting. say that, you know, on one hand, we have good reason to be excited, but on the other hand, it was expected to work at 16 meters per second. We didn't expect this one to fail. Wow. Just like it's facing. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me of Blade Runner. Yeah. I remember that scene. Resolve. 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 Okay. All right, slower. Beautiful. Yeah, so look at it wrinkling up. Ooh, catch it. That is awesome. You can even see a piece of it looks like we have some clear. Hey, the, the lighting's pretty hot right there. But yeah, yeah, right. yeah, that's piece of But you know, if you back either. up a little bit, you can actually see an abrasion layer yeah. lifted yeah. off. It's just sitting there. That, that piece of abrasion layer is just 
sitting there. What we've got here is what we're calling classic airbag damage, where the outermost layers are there as sacrificial elements to protect the bladder layer. It's a lot like a bulletproof vest. It gets torn up and you tear the outside part, the, the outer layers of the vest, and uh, you protect the uh, user on the inside. In this case, it's the airbag and the lander. abrasion tool and in NASA you have to have your name shortened to an acronym so naturally that makes us the creators of the rat I can't tell you how many suggestions I get almost daily for logos it's a bit of a joke around here uh, and in the space science community that we are building a rat issues facing us is the dust skirt to prevent the dust from coming out perhaps billowing up and damaging the other instruments however it's a very slow moving drill and it only sends up small wisps of material into the air we don't like the skirt it's almost as like you're saying okay we want to eject the dust for digging this hole so we can look in but we're building a cover right around the hole at the same time. 